Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Where I ask the question again and again and again, what's new and exciting in your world this weekend? Uh, um, how should I say this? I've been looking. And, and, uh, and you're, 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 actually, <laughs> you're actually flummoxed by the question? How many years have I asked this question? <laughs> I'm fl- right. I'm not quite sure how, how to approach this. A couple of interesting things. I had occasion to look up for the first time. It never occurred to me to look it up before. And the number's astounding. The amount of electricity that's used in Bitcoin mining. So, of course, you've got you know, banks of computers that are doing whatever the mathematics they do to mine Bitcoin. This is just Bitcoin. This is not cryptocurrency in general. Bitcoin consumes 110 terawatt hours annually. If I knew what a terawatt hour was, I would probably be very impressed by that. Yeah, well, hence my not quite knowing how to attack this problem. I can give you some perspective. That is more electricity than the entire country of Finland uses. <laughs> get, get the hell out of here. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. It's over one half of 1% of the entire electrical output of the planet. So when people ask me why I'm not mining Bitcoin, here's the answer. But I've seen in the past people complain about the environmental impact of Bitcoin. I didn't know what they were talking about. Now I'm beginning to understand it. But... I went and looked up the electricity consumption of the banking industry. Just think electronic banking. That's actually double. It's over 230 terawatt hours a year. Not to say that Bitcoin is small, but apparently this is something that's been going on. This isn't news that all of a sudden we start burning all this electricity. We were doing it anyways with electronic banking. But what leads to this whole revelation is an article I ran across recently Stronghold Digital Mining, a company that does Bitcoin mining, that's all they do. They use so much electricity that they have recently purchased an electrical power plant in Pennsylvania. (laughs) (laughs) The entire plant, they just bought the whole thing. The entire plant will be dedicated to running their Bitcoin mining operation. The place is about 80 miles north of Pittsburgh. They'll be burning waste coal, which apparently is a byproduct of coal mining that is otherwise bad for the environment. And they claim that they'll be able to reclaim a thousand acres of land when they siphon up all this waste coal and burn it to fuel their Bitcoin mining operation. But there we have it, an entire electrical power plant dedicated to mining Bitcoins. That seems a little excessive, doesn't it? I mean, I've got it to really admire does. them. Right? I have to admire them for going out and buying the thing they need to do their business well. But you got to be kidding me. It reminds me of somebody said of General Motors once upon a time that it's a health insurance company that makes cars on the side. <laughs> this, well, this is a Bitcoin mining company that generates electricity on the side. I think my favorite example of that sort of thing is McDonald's, which is a real estate company that happens to sell hamburgers. Yes. Isn't that funny? Anyway, I want to bring you to America's left coast, the beautiful town of San Francisco. And you might remember not too long ago, we talked about grocery stores that were shutting down in Southern California when the local politicians required them to pay a much higher wage than they were ready to pay. Well, now we're going all the way up to San Francisco. We're getting stores closing down or limiting their hours because The shoplifting has become so profligate that they can't keep the doors open. I can't remember exactly when, but I remember hearing that the authorities around San Francisco were not going to prosecute shoplifting cases anymore. I think you talked about it on one of our episodes. If I did, I probably said something like, here's my unlikely prediction over what might happen, that lots of people would engage in shoplifting and the businesses would be forced to deal with that in some other way. And Walgreens apparently just shuts down stores. Wow. They're gone. Now there won't be Walgreens. But the one that got my attention today was Safeway, the grocery store in the Castro district, is just limiting their hours. And what's the phrase they use? Off the charts shoplifting. Grocery stores operate on razor thin margins. And when that much of the profit walks out the door in the form of shoplifting, they can't stay in business very much longer. And then what will we hear? We'll hear that they were evil and racist because they shut down these stores in the inner cities. Well, guess what? 
You have to have the rule of law or none of the rest of this works. Has San Francisco, has the city offered any explanation as to why it's doing this? I have no idea. You look at these sorts of things and you say to yourself, do I really want to go to San Francisco? And my answer is no, I do not. You know, sooner or later, when it hurts enough, they'll reevaluate their policies. They'll still call everybody bad names when they do, but they'll reevaluate because they'll have no choice. That was not the foolishness of the week. You're going to top that? Oh, it's not even close. It's going to be something that you don't know a thing about. Football, you know, something that men enjoy. Sports, 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 sports. And you go walking in circles at the local mall when everybody's watching the game. There's this guy, Colin Kaepernick, had himself a falling out with the NFL. And I'm kind of ambivalent about this. In some ways, I think it was deserved that he got shown the door. In other ways, I can't believe for even a second that he is not one of the best 35 quarterbacks or so in the world, in which case he should have a job. But he doesn't because he became a bit of a pain for people who did not want to deal with the things that he thought were necessary to deal with. Until this point, this is all actually quite reasonable, right? We could probably sit and have a reasoned discussion as to if he's right or not, because, you know, I'm going to cheerfully admit that at least in part, he's absolutely right. But, but here's where it gets ridiculous. He's got a TV show coming out on Netflix. I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm going to write something about it. So stay tuned. In this TV show, he referred to people who are drafted by the NFL as being slaves. The draft and trading camp is slavery, according to Colin Kaepernick. I just thought it would be fun to talk about what slavery looks like to Colin Kaepernick. Do you have any idea what the minimum salary in the NFL is 2021? I don't, but let me guess, because I know that the top salaries go up well into the millions. Starting salary, I'm going to hazard a guess, 175000 Oh, yeah, you're really close. 660000 Woof! Wow. Starting salary for a first year player walking onto an NFL field for the first time in his life. He is guaranteed a salary of at least six hundred and sixty thousand. That is well into the one percent. I think the one percent starts around four hundred and ten thousand. That's astounding. Well, I guess the one percenters in this case and only in this case are slaves. Anyway, let's continue for a moment. That's the answer for first-day players. The league average, well over $3 million. $3 million. That's the league average. Now, that doesn't take into account. Well, it does take into account, but it doesn't bring to the front and center those guys who are making 10 dollars 20 dollars $30 million a year. Those are salaries reserved for the ultra-uber-talented. But $660,000 as a minimum salary for 22-year-old guys. What's he pointing to, to use the word slavery? That the owners of the teams make them do things. Welcome to the job market. (laughs) Well, apparently in this case, you can't expect anything out of people when you only pay them $660,000 a year. Astounding. Stay tuned, everyone, because I'll be pumping out an article on this at some point this week. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. What starts this topic is an article from Associated Press saying that elephants have evolved to be tuskless because of ivory poaching. It is interesting that elephants could evolve to be tuskless. It's a serious problem for them to have tusks that poachers want. I don't know anything about the rate at which species develop changes like this. Nonetheless, if indeed this is the case, it's predictable. If you're going to go out and cull the elephants with the long tusks, you give a competitive advantage to those that have shorter tusks or no tusks at all. Actually, there is a study that was done maybe 20 years ago by a couple of scientists, David Conover and Stephen Munch, and they were looking at the effect of fishing quotas on the stock of fish. As you catch the fish, if you catch juveniles, you have to throw them back, which makes sense. You want the juveniles to repopulate the species. It seems like a good sustainable practice. And yet what they found was that this practice intended to protect the stock of fish actually diminishes the stock of fish because 
when you catch a small fish, one of two things is true. Either it's a juvenile or it's a particularly small adult. And you throw it back and what you have just done is introduce a competitive advantage to the small fish. And before you know it, according to the scientists, your fish now are growing to be smaller. You have genetically selected them to be small. That's actually kind of funny. It's an interesting unintended consequence. I always wonder about this sort of thing. How long did it take to evolve in this direction? Nonetheless, there's all kinds of interesting things around this. And I'm thinking about our friend Howie's book, Free Our Markets. Yeah. In that book, he wrote about elephants, so we're back to elephants now, in Kenya and Zimbabwe. And he's looking at 1979 population. So in 1979, the elephant population in Kenya was about 65,000. In Zimbabwe at the same time, about 30,000. And by 1989, so 10 years later, the population of elephants in Kenya had dropped from 65,000 to about 19,000. Whereas Zimbabwe, the numbers had increased from 30,000 to 43,000. And what you find if you dig in a little bit, as Howie did, is that it was a different method of dealing with elephants that yielded the radically different outcomes. Now, Howie, in his book, to give full information, says there were different things going on in the two countries at the time. I think there was war in one and not in the other, whatever it is. But he points to one of the biggest driving factors to this difference. And was it Kenya's that fell, dropped by like half, and Zimbabwe's increased by like 40%. So marked, marked difference in elephant populations. One of the main driving differences, how he claims, is that Kenya was a signatory to the international ban on ivory. This made all kinds of things very difficult. Anything that used ivory as a source. Right. You think about pianos. Chess sets used to be ivory. Right. Billiard balls used to be ivory. Things like this. They're all outlawed now. In the United States, you cannot go buy something that's made of ivory. You might be able to get something in an antique shop in a product that gets an exemption because it's so old. But you can't order a new Steinway piano and expect to get ivory. And just stop and think about the ramifications there. You want to protect the elephants and their noble creatures and all of that. And it seems good and right and just and proper that what you do is you ban the trade in ivory because people are killing the elephants for the ivory. That doesn't mean that ivory is not still desired. And that's the key. It doesn't mean that people still don't want it. What you have done is you have dramatically reduced the supply of it. That's right. And so with the same demand that you had before, the price is now going to skyrocket. You just made it way more profitable for people to poach elephants than it was before. And what does poaching look like? Well, people walk in, shoot the elephant, put a chainsaw to the tusks, take them off, and leave. And get out as quickly as they can. So the rest of the elephant, the meat, the skin, is left to rot. Which means that roughly 100% of the elephant is not going to be used for anything. Yeah. We're getting off the topic of elephants here, but there's an interesting example of this with rhinoceroses, and this came up recently. Some company, I'd read this maybe six months ago, developed fake rhinoceros horns that were indistinguishable in whatever way people distinguish these things from the real thing. And their goal was to flood the market with these. Right. And what do you do there? You drive the price down yep. and you make it now no longer profitable to poach the rhinoceros. And you're right earlier that it was Kenya who saw the decrease. Zimbabwe, on the other hand, 30,000 to 43,000. And here's where it gets really, really interesting. Because both countries are going to see elephants as a scarce resource. Yes. That's what they are. And they chase them down and saw off their tusks precisely because they're a rare creature. Now, it didn't work out that way. It wasn't treated the same way in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, just to underline it, they experienced about a 30% increase in their elephant population at the same time over the same decade that Kenya's dropped by roughly half. Zimbabwe was not a signatory. It did not ban the sale of ivory. But what happened is because they did not ban it, villagers would get together and they would collectively own and raise elephants. Why? Because they're going to cut off their tusks and sell them, to which, you know, everybody clutches their hearts and says, oh my God, no. But stop and think it through for a minute. By not outlawing the ivory, what Zimbabwe did was to take people's profit incentive and turn it toward the husbanding of the elephants. 
So the villagers would raise the elephants in healthy environments as best they can. And this was brilliant. When it came time to call the elephants, they wouldn't simply kill them. They would sell safari rights to rich Westerners. So the rich Westerner pays $50,000, comes to the village, and they can't kill any elephant. They have to kill the specific elephant, the older one, typically the male that's not going to be reproducing, that the villagers point out, and he gets his picture taken with it. The villagers get the ivory. Not just that, they get the meat, they get the skin. You get the full use of the animal. It's actually kind of interesting when you think it through. It is fascinating. It really is a story about incentives. And one of these two countries, along with many other countries on the face of the earth, wanted to look like they were doing the right thing. The other country wanted to do the best it could within the tolerances it faced. And I think you identified the problem earlier when you said, look, whether you have the ban or not, people are still going to want the ivory. And that's the key here. People want to use the resource. The question with the ban or not the ban has nothing to do with the use of the resource. Their desire to use the resource will remain. The question is whether there is an incentive to husband the resource, to conserve it, to grow it. And I give you, as case in point, Christmas trees. Here in the United States, our 150 million households every year go out into the woods, or we pay someone to go out into the woods, and we cut down Christmas trees, we take them to our living rooms, we dress them up, we sing gleeful songs to them, and two weeks later, we chuck them in the garbage. Now, that's a recipe for massive deforestation, and yet there's no shortage of Christmas trees. It's never once been a recipe for deforestation. Right. If anything, it's a recipe for reforestation because people realize, wow, I've got this land sitting out here. I can make some money by planting Christmas trees. You look around your property and you think, well, if I just take that plot over there and grow a bunch of trees, people will pay me for them. Yeah. That just doesn't sound right. That sounds all dumb and stupid. And yet it's exactly right. And that's the key. I mention my MBA students pretty much every week now. These people must be interesting me. This last week, we had a conversation that went along these lines, and somebody said something about, well, the problem with whatever it was we were talking about is people's profit motive. We have to reduce the profit motive, to which I said, hang on. That's part and parcel of human nature. You can't just wave a magic wand and reduce the profit motive. Good public policy harnesses the profit motive to get to the end that you want. And to do that, You've got to set aside your emotions and say, well, I love the elephant. I want to save the elephant. No, what you really want to do is feel good about saving the elephant. If you really care about saving the elephant, you're not going to ban the ivory. Quite the reverse. You're going to allow the market to flourish because that's what benefits the elephant. And people are bound and determined to look good. They want to be saying the right thing in public so everybody can see and hear them and say, yes, you are a good person. And yet, you and I know full well that the absolute best way to guarantee that there will always be elephants, indeed that their numbers would grow and their herds would thrive, is to get them on the menu at McDonald's. (laughs) That sounds horrible, but it's actually true. I say this all the time. You want to save the spot at all? Get it on the menu. And how do I know this? There's no shortage of cows. Yep. And there never, ever will be. As long as there's this tasty thing called a hamburger there will never be a shortage of cows. There will be a shortage of cows if vegetarians get their way and have us no longer eating meat. Then you're going to see a massive reduction in the number of cows. I ate a bacon cheeseburger the other night, and it was so wonderful. It was so good that I thought, wow, it's a wonder that I'm alive in a day and age where this is even possible. I share your opinion, but I'll also say on the side that there is an important issue that we should be very concerned with, and that's the conditions under which the animals are raised. Yeah, I think that's right. Some of these animals come very close to being sentient, and if they're being raised in pens where they never see the outside and their horrible conditions, I consider that a moral problem. Believe it or not, I do too. I think it's especially the case with pigs or incredibly intelligent animals. It's less important with cows, but notice I didn't say not important. Mm. I don't want to throw in with the vegetarians all that much, but I understand and I kind of agree. Nonetheless, I think the original point stands. If you want to save something in wholesale, get people eating it. I'll point to the buffalo here. The buffalo were nearly extinct. 
they were almost all gone. And now they're so plentiful that I can have a Buffalo burger anytime I want one. But that would have been an act so reckless, what, 30, 40 years ago, that nobody would ever even do such a thing. You know, these things do come back and they can make brilliant comebacks. The Buffalo's worth discussing. I'm going to step a little bit outside my expertise here because I'm not hey. 100% up on the history. <laughs> Why should this be any Why different? Why should that stop you when it doesn't stop anyone else? Because an observant person might say in response, well, but look, the reason the buffalo were close to extinction was precisely because people were eating them. Someone could say, well, look, people are consuming the buffalo and you get fewer buffaloes. And the difference between the buffalo and the cow example is property rights. The buffalo largely were roaming free. There weren't property rights to them. You just went and took whatever buffalo it was you wanted. And notice when that happens, we're back to the situation of people have an incentive to use the resource. There's the buffalo. It's got hide. It's got meat. It's got whatever. I'm going to go out and grab it. But without property rights, without my being able to say, that is my buffalo in here, I'm going to draw a line on the map and all the buffaloes in here are mine and no one else is allowed to get them. Without that, Nobody has an incentive to conserve, to husband the resource. It's the property rights that make the difference. And here's where that elephant story gets really interesting. Because when we think about Kenya and they're becoming a signatory to the law, what they effectively did was forfeited their property rights to the elephants. Yes. The Zimbabweans, on the other hand, said, no, those are ours. And then they worked out a relatively rudimentary system by which they could be protected and then utilized. Yeah. But it all started with the property rights. When they were pressed to sign a deal which would rob them of property rights, they said, nope, never going to happen. And turns out, as heartless as that would have sounded, it was actually the right call. If your goal is really to increase the population of these elephants, it was absolutely the right call. The sad thing is, is that over time, this has gone by the wayside. The political upheaval in Africa is such that we don't talk about these things anymore. It was an interesting thing that happened back in the late 70s, early 80s, but it's not something that's on the table right now. And that's kind of sad, but at least we've got something we can point to when we try to do this again for yet another species. The importance of property rights here cannot be underestimated. You'll see the examples all over the place if you start to look, and I give you the common room in a college dorm. How well kept is the common room versus the individual person's room, or the common bathroom versus a private bathroom? And it comes back to this issue of property rights. If everybody has access, nobody can be stopped, then everyone has an incentive to use it, and no one has an incentive to preserve it. And I think anybody here in the United States, most of our listeners are from the U.S., although I got to give a shout out to our friends in Australia. You guys are real interesting to us and we want to come and visit real soon. But as you think about it in the U.S. context, we've got property rights in many, many things. So it's a language that we're used to dealing with. Other people in other places might not be. But when I put my foot down and I say something like, all right, you can't do that. This is mine. Everybody kind of knows what I mean. If the neighbor wants to drift over the border between our houses, I have a built-in defense. You can't do that. This is my property. And he would know exactly what I meant because I have recourse through the courts to enforce my property right. The more you look at it, everything we do is predicated upon some understanding of property right. Little children know this. They say things like, that's not fair. That's my ball. Everybody knows right from the earliest of times what's yours and what's ours and what's somebody else's. And the things that are yours are the things that get cared for by you. One of the phrases that people use is, we all own it. Like the national parks, we all own it. When it comes to property rights in the sense of incentives, those words have no meaning. We all own it is identical to saying nobody owns it. That's right. Because nobody has an incentive to preserve it, to husband it, whatever it is, because anybody can walk in and use it. But I'll give you an interesting observation. In the local parks here in Tucson, we've got a number of city parks. They're overrun by homeless like you wouldn't believe. Mm. You probably wouldn't take your small children to play in the park. That's because we all own it. Because we all own it, anybody can just sleep there and call it home. I have a friend who has a house on an island in Maine. 
and the island is populated with lobstermen. That's virtually the only industry that's there. They've developed this, I don't want to say legal, it's more of a social agreement of how they divvy up the ocean bottom amongst the lobstermen. It's kind of known that this guy, Joe, over here, he's got everything from, you know, left of those trees up to that little island over there. That's his fishing ground. Nobody else is allowed to go there. And this arrangement predates any of the conservation laws that are in existence. What's happened is that the lobstermen have developed a sense of conserving their lobsters. So long as you know that nobody's going to come into your territory and start taking your lobsters, you have a profit incentive not to take more than is sustainable because you want to be able to come back there next year and take them again. And look at what else you can do. You can take a day off. Yes. You don't have to risk your life in bad conditions. You know that your space will still be your space tomorrow. Somebody's not going to come in and take all your lobsters if you're not paying attention. The social mores in this place are such that that behavior would never be tolerated. It's like the rule of law that just shows up one day. We all refer to this as spontaneous order, and that's exactly what happens. One guy does one thing, one guy does another. They meet, they yell at each other, another thing happens, and before you know it, everything looks like a map on the ocean floor, and that's just fantastic. You can see where with fish, this would be more difficult. But with anything that crawls around on the bottom, it just got real easy. I had my students read an article about the Deepwater Horizon, that drilling well that spilled a bunch of oil out in the Gulf of Mexico back in whenever it was, the early 2000s or thereabouts. And one of the students said, and again, we were talking about the profit incentive. Well, the problem is the profit incentive. The oil company had an incentive to cut corners, to not employ all the safety procedures, to use shoddy equipment because it was more profitable to do so. At which point I said, hang on, the profit incentive is not an incentive to cut corners. It's an incentive to pursue profit. The reason you got an outcome like we got with the Deepwater Horizon, at least in part, is because Congress had limited the oil company's liability to $250 million. Any damage beyond that, the company's not liable for. And so what Congress, in effect, did was to remove people's property rights. If I've got oceanfront property and all this oil comes up and spoils everything, and I would turn to sue the company, well, I can't do that because Congress has limited its liability. In other words, Congress has taken away my property rights. If the company had been fully liable for everything that happened and knew that it was fully liable at the beginning, the profit incentive would have caused the company to employ much more careful procedures to be much more safe than it was. Now, I'm glossing over lots of details. It turns out Congress revoked the liability after the fact. But again, this comes back to the profit incentive and property rights. Put those things together and you get conservation. And if you really want to be sure that the oil companies will never allow a bad thing to happen, fix it so that they have to pay 100 times the damage. Right. <laughs> right. They'll never cut a corner again. Yeah, the problem there is I think you go in the opposite direction. You get no oil at all. Oil would be more expensive, and this is what you have to deal with. These are the things that grown-ups have to take into account. I live here in the real world where everything is a trade-off. The elephants are actually instructive. The elephant thing, and that's what I think I'm going to call it from now on, the elephant thing, actually teaches us so much that I think every person in sixth or seventh grade should be studying this. It's not the heartless thing you think it is. The earlier on we can disabuse you of that pernicious idea that these are moral outrages, well, the sooner off we can get you off that and onto reality, the better off everybody's going to be. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we don't talk about elephants at all. Until then, follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Backstage, where the conversation still continues to this very day. And go ahead. Send us email. Words and Numbers podcast at gmail.com. Everybody, be nice to each other and not to Ant. And I'll see you all and you, Ant, next week. Have a good one. See you next week, James.